Hi and welcome to my OCR AA level biology revision session with me Christine. So today's lesson I want to look at types of immunity and sources of medicines. So let's just take a step back though and remind ourselves about the specific immune response and the fact that the first time you have an exposure to a pathogen you are going to have to go through what's known as the clonal selection and then clonal expansion and we have this increase in our antibody concentration in the blood. So this is known as our primary immune response as the phagocytes come along and engulf and digest the pathogen along with the antibodies, our antibody concentration decreases. Well the fact that we had that clonal expansion what resulted in us ending up with memory cells and our memory cells allow for a faster response when we have this secondary exposure to the same pathogen. So this secondary exposure leads to our secondary immune response and that therefore means that we have this increase in our antibody concentration in our blood. We are able to fight the pathogen off faster. So this is important for us to remember because when we look at the types of immunity that you can have, there are different types. So the first one I want to look at is passive immunity. So if you have passive immunity, this is where you have had antibodies introduced to the body which have come from another organism. So the other organism has produced the antibodies themselves they have been collected and then introduced to your body. Now, one of the natural ways that this happens is when the mother is actually, first of all, growing the baby inside the uterus through the placenta. So the mother is exposed to the pathogen. The mother is going to produce the antibodies and those antibodies are then going to diffuse from the placenta into the fetus blood and therefore it is going to be circulating in the fetal blood. After the baby is born, then as the mother breastfeeds, that is going to result in the antibodies that the mother is producing going into the breast milk and the baby is going to be feeding from that breast milk and they are therefore going to get this passive immunity. So they are not producing the antibodies themselves, they are being given them, they're being introduced to them. Another way that this can happen, which is not a natural way but an artificial way, is where they are given an injection. So for example, if you've ever had a tetanus shot or you've had to have an injection for rabies, that is where they have taken the antibodies against the toxins and they have injected it into the body. It can also happen through a blood transfusion. So that's a passive immunity because this is an introduction of these antibodies from another organism. So if we look at the active immunity then, active immunity is where the production of those antibodies are by the B lymphocytes, the B plasma lymphocytes, after the body's defense mechanisms have been stimulated by an antigen. So if we're talking about a natural active immunity, we're talking about you being exposed to the pathogen. So it could be where somebody has coughed or sneezed in front of you or they've touched a surface and you've then touched that and the pathogen has got into your body. You have been naturally exposed to that pathogen. Your immune system is then going to kick into play and you are going to start to go through that clonal selection and clonal expansion, creating the B plasma cells and then producing the antibodies. An artificial active immunity is where you are vaccinated against the potential exposure of a pathogen. So this is where you are given either a dead or weakened version of the pathogen. Now this could be the virus, this could be a bacterial cell, it could be a toxin molecule, it could be an isolated antigen, it could be a genetically engineered antigen. Whatever that dead or weakened version of the pathogen is, that is going to be injected into the body. That will therefore result in clonal selection and clonal expansion occurring so that your B lymphocytes are activated to produce the necessary antibodies 
against that pathogen. Well, the presence of that antigen or any of those parts of the pathogen are actually stimulating our primary immune response. And what's the purpose? The purpose is that we result in the memory cells and those memory cells are then able to be activated if we are exposed in a secondary immune response. So if we are exposed again to the actual pathogen, we have those memory cells, we therefore have a faster immune response against them. So you can either have the passive immunity where you are provided with the antibodies, you do not produce the cells or the antibodies yourself, or you have the active immunity where you are producing those antibodies through the body. So then we have to think about, well, what's the purpose of vaccinations? And we actually have gone through this ourselves in the last four years, which is a crazy thought to think about. There's some key terms that you need to know for your exam, which actually we've lived through. An epidemic is the spread of a communicable disease to a lot of people at a local or national level. So when we suffered with the COVID epidemic, first of all, it was local, national, then it became a COVID pandemic. This is when it spread rapidly across several countries and continents. And that's when we had to come down with our lockdown in the fact that we had to stop people from migrating to other areas and therefore causing the transmission of the communicable disease a lot faster through the different countries. So lockdown was a way in which we were trying to prevent the spread of the communicable disease, COVID. Now, one of the things that they did do is they sped up the production of the vaccinations. And the reason they sped up the production of vaccinations and they got the vaccinations out as fast as possible was to help us get what's known as herd immunity. So if we have a significant number of individuals who have been vaccinated against whatever the pathogen is, what that will then do is that will then ensure that if you're vaccinated, remember this is an artificial active immunity, you are therefore going to be producing your memory cells. Your memory cells will then lead to a faster response that secondary immune response and that will therefore mean that you should be able to fight the infection faster than it is able to reproduce and that would result in protection being given to those who do not have the immunity within the community. So by having what's known as the herd immunity, by getting enough people vaccinated, you therefore protect all of the individuals and that's what they try to do with the COVID vaccine and that's what they do every year when it comes to vaccinations against the flu virus. Now it's important to understand that influenza, the flu, can either be the bacterial version or it can be a viral version. Now what's really interesting is that we have to have new vaccinations every year because of random mutations that occur. Random mutations that occur result in slight changes in those antigens. If you have a slight change in those antigens, that therefore means that clonal selection and clonal expansion have to happen again. And that makes it take a longer time process for you to fight against the pathogen if you're exposed to it. So by having these vaccinations occur every year, what they do is they look at the likelihood of the antigen which is going to cause the most problems. So the pathogen with the antigen that's going to spread the fastest and they try to vaccinate against that one. So it may be that you get vaccinated for example for your flu and then you end up getting the flu um, communicable disease, but that's because you actually have been exposed to a pathogen that's got a slightly different antigen. So therefore, although you were vaccinated, that vaccine wasn't effective against the one that you were exposed to. 
Okay, so we also need to look at some sources of medicine. So we understand how vaccine, vaccines work and how they can be used to activate our immune system. But actually, there are some medicines out there that we can take to help to decrease the effects that we have, for example, of other diseases which are non-communicable. So if we're talking about, for example, painkillers, some of the medicines that we need to take that are going to kill the pain that we're having, whether it's a headache, whether it is that we have hurt ourselves, well, these actually originate from plants. So the painkiller aspirin originated from the willow tree. So therefore, that plant is really important as a source of medicine. If we're looking at, for example, people who have heart disease, they need, may need to take the heart drug dig Digitas. And if they have to take Digitas, that is something that originates from the foxgloves plant. So plants are a very important source of medicine. And that's one of the reasons why we need to conserve the biodiversity on planet Earth. Well, it's not just about the plants, it's also about our microorganisms. So penicillin is an antibiotic which was discovered by Alexander Fleming. Now, penicillin is an antibiotic that's produced by a fungus which actually stops the growth of bacterial cells. The reason it does this is because the antibiotics block the processes that occur in prokaryotic cells but they do not have an effect on eukaryotic cells. So they're very selective in what they are going to stop. So therefore the antibiotics are only effective on prokaryotic cells, which is why it's safe for us to take medicines which are antibiotic. And when Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin, it soon became a drug that was used in one in six times it was a drug that was prescribed to help prevent some of the communicable diseases. But we have a problem. And that problem is that through the overuse of the antibiotics, through the overprescription, through, from the fact that some patients were taking the antibiotics, starting to feel better, and then not completing a full course, this resulted in an antibiotic resistance within the bacterial cells. So if we think back to our natural selection topic area, we know that natural selection is to do with mutations. Now mutations occur in the genetic information completely by chance. Mutations, which are spontaneous, will result in variation. So if we have, for example, our bacterial cells and we have a random mutation by chance that results in, as you can see, my purple uh, bacterial cell, then what you end up with is one cell which is now resistant to the antibiotic. Now, what that means is the antibiotic can no longer either fuse with the membrane or with the biochemical processes inside, so therefore is no longer stopping the prokaryotic cell from going through division. So after the antibiotic treatment, although that has been effective in killing all those that were not resistant, we have one which is resistant. And that one which is resistant now has the capacity to go through cell division. So because we're talking about prokaryotic cells, they will divide by binary fission and they can do that at a very fast rate. They can go from one to two in 20 minutes. So once we have this random mutation that has resulted in antibiotic resistance, we have this selective pressure. The antibiotic is killing off all of those that do not have the resistant gene. The one that has the resistant gene is now able to reproduce and now we have a population all that contain that resistant gene. So that becomes a problem if you try then to use that same antibiotic to kill off the prokaryote it's not effective. And examples of that are MRSA and C. difficile. So these are ones you needed to know before in more detail, but now you just need to know the names of them. So antibiotic resistance has become a big issue and it means that we are having to really go back and investigate what we can do 
to try to reduce the impact of this antibiotic resistance. And therefore, that means that doctors can only prescribe antibiotics if they are sure that it is a bacterial cell that is causing the disease. Now, that would be through staining. They need to then try and make sure that they know which antibiotic to give to the patient. So what they may do then is take a sample, send that off to a lab. That will then allow for them to grow the colonies of the bacterial cells and then they will do differential staining whether it's gram positive whether it's gram negative so they can ensure that they are able to give the right antibiotic for killing that pathogen that therefore should reduce the potential of antibiotic resistance building up within the population because they're only given the correct antibiotic for the prokaryote that the person is actually infected with. Well, there are other things that we can do with regards to medicines and drugs in the future. So there is such a thing called pharmacogenetics. Now, basically, this is where they are developing personalized drugs. Well, what does that actually mean? What that means is they're going to look at the genetic material of the patient and the genetic material made up of the pathogen and what they can then do is they can find a way to produce a drug that is effective to only those key parts. So if we use the example of people who unfortunately suffer with breast cancer, 30% of those people who suffer have a mutation in what's called the HER2 gene. So if they can provide drugs which are used to shut down the activity, so therefore inhibit the expression of this mutated gene, they can actually use that in a way to prevent the development further of breast cancer. So they can therefore take the genome of the patient and of a pathogen, if it is a communicable disease, and look at both of them both of them before they decide on the treatment that they're going to give so it is important that you understand the vaccinations that can be used that you understand how they are useful in preventing the spread of communicable diseases but also the fact that the medicines that we use today have all come from organisms that were on the earth long before humans evolved and therefore it's important that we maintain the biodiversity on the planet earth and also that we understand linking to module six when you learn about DNA sequencing that the more we learn about the genetic makeup of the different species and the more that we can use that and put that together with bioinformatics and biocomputational genetics, what we can then do is we can formulate the best plan for treating future generations. Well, I hope you've liked this video and if you have then please do click on the like button and subscribe to my channel. Also do check out my revision platform, www.eiqchat.com.